So as I said in the uh, welcome, I'm, I'm usually, I'm up here quite a bit, but it's usually when Howard's away, so I did have a little nervousness this morning to, uh, to do this in front of Howard, um, but I do want to say that um, I really could not ask for a better boss. He's a man who leads by example more than any other minister I've ever known, so we love you, Howard. But I found a good joke to kind of settle my nerves and maybe yours too. So. Maybe it's a joke, maybe it's not, I don't know. The CEO of Kentucky Fried Chicken called the Vatican, asked to speak with the head cardinal. Oh, this could have, it could have happened, come on. Asked to speak with the head cardinal. He said, I have something I'd like to share with you. We at KFC have just been so blessed with all of our chicken that we want to now give to the Catholic Church and the good work you're doing. We're going to give you a gift of billions of dollars to further the work you're doing in the world. And the cardinal said, wow. That is just amazing. And the CEO of KFC said, but there is a catch. We would like to do a little editing on the Lord's Prayer. You know that part that says, give us this day our daily bread? Could we change that to give us this day our daily chicken? <laughs> and the cardinal said, I'll have to check with my boss. Calls the, uh, the Pope's office and said, your holiness, I have good news and bad news. The good news is... I have found us a benefactor who's going to give us an ongoing gift in the terms of billions. It will solve our financial problems. It will help us continue to do the good work we're doing around the world. And the Pope said, and the bad news? And the bad news is we're going to lose the Wonder Bread account. Alternative facts, I think. I know I'm not sure what that is. No, no, no. It's just a joke. Come on. So today, it is two days before Valentine's Day, and I really wanted to talk about love. Is that all right with you? And the, the scripture that came to mind was perfect love casts out fear. It's been one of my favorites my whole life. I love that idea that perfect love casts out fear. Fear, And so I went back to that chapter. It's in 1 John chapter 4. Beautiful, beautiful um, writing there. We're not sure. It was probably not historically written from the, the beloved disciple John, but from someone in that name who was writing um, this letter to the early Christian church. But there's this deep admonition from the writer of this epistle for us to all, or actually to the people he was writing to, but we take it 20 centuries later, for ourselves, that we step into this nature of love. And what the, the writer tells us is that that is what God is. Twice in this chapter, the phrase, God is love, appears. The, the Bible verse I was talking about, the title that I brought from, said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears was not made perfect in love. But I want to back up a little bit before that. In chapter, the same chapter, verse 16, it says this, whoever lives in love lives in God, and God is in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on that day. In this world, we are like Jesus. This is a mystical understanding that the name of God, the shape of the universe, the fabric of reality can be described as love. In unity, we teach that there are many paths to God. I heard Howard one time talk about it being as, as though there are many paths going up the mountain. And at the base of the mountain, they may seem very, very far apart. Different names, different sacred texts, different writings, different songs. But as we go up in this, this evolution, spiraling towards greater and greater awareness of truth, at the top are the mystics of all the religions, and they all agree on this fact. God is love. Ernest Holmes, the founder of Science of Mind, he said it this way, love is the givingness of spirit into creation. It is the evolutionary impulse of all that is. It wants to love. And that's who we are. That is the truth of your being. Before you had a body, after you lay it down, there is an eternal, birthless, deathless, changeless essence of your spirit that is pure Love, divine love. This is what we teach in unity. There is no separation between you and God. You are 
Some of you might think of it as like a facet on a diamond, a diamond that has infinite facets. Each of us is one aspect, one beautiful, unique, irreplaceable, unrepeatable expression of God's perfect heart. That's who you are, and that's who I am. That's the first point I want to make in this talk today, is that perfect love is who you are. Now, we have to enter a little bit of a conversation about the absolute and the relative. The absolute truth is you are love. The relative truth is you forget sometimes. <laughs> As do I. Somewhere on Facebook this week, I saw it expressed this way. It said, I am a masterpiece, and I am also a work in progress. So that feels good. Let's say, repeat it for me. I am a masterpiece, I am a masterpiece. and I am a work in progress. See, the absolute truth is you are perfect right now, just the way you are, without changing anything. You are a perfect expression of God's own love. You're a masterpiece. And yet, you wouldn't be in church on a Sunday morning if you didn't have a little improving to do. All of us have ways that we, we can step into that love more, more clearly, more beautifully in our human experience, in our human lifetimes, in our human relationships. And I have found that relationships are the graduate school of life. Anybody else find that to be true? Because I can love you all as an idea. From up here in this pulpit, it's so easy to love you all. You're just so beautiful out there. But it's when I have to, like, you know, those one-on-one -on -one relationships where you might say something that sounds like what my dad used to say it and it hurt my feelings. It's harder in those one-on-one -on -one relationships. That is the relative. And you know what I find is um, when I first began my path in recovery in the 12-step tradition, a very wise man with many, many decades of sobri sobriety, he told me this. He said, many people in this path of recovery, they die after they get sober or get clean because they don't get perfect. That so much of the struggle of their life had been centered around this thing called addiction. And when they get there and they begin, they, they put the plug in the jug, as we used to say, and they, they begin to practice abstinence from that, they find that there are still issues, there's still problems. They didn't get struck perfect. My uh, first sponsor, when I did my first fifth step, which is where you, you know, spill your guts, it's not a fun experience. <clears throat> anyway, but I digress. One of the, 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 the jobs of the sponsor, according to the very kind of traditional way from the big book of AA, is that we, the sponsor um, points out the character defects of the person giving the inventory. That's, uh, and that's very intimidating to have someone tell you how you're wrong. And my sponsor, the very first thing she said to me, she said, well, I spotted one of your, your character defects. You're a perfectionist. And I said, no, ma'am, I cannot be a perfectionist. I have never done anything perfectly my entire life. <laughs> and to which she just went like this. Perfectionism. It happens in unity, too. People get here. They begin to apply these transformative life teachings around their finances and their relationships and their health, and they begin to experience life abundant, as Jesus said we are to experience. But they don't get perfect. And not only that, the other people in their class, are, they're not perfect either. And it's challenging. Perfectionism. Brene Brown an amazing author here in Houston. She's done a lot of work around vulnerability and authenticity. In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, she, types, uh, she talks about imperfection, about perfectionism. She says this, perfectionism is not the same thing as striving to be your best. Perfectionism is not about healthy achievement and growth. Perfectionism, for, per, ha, perfectionism is the belief that if we live perfect, looked perfect, and act perfect, we can minimize or avoid the pain of blame, judgment, and shame. It's a shield. Perfectionism is a 20-ton shield that we lug around thinking it will protect us when, in fact, it's the thing that's really preventing us from taking flight. Perfectionism is not self-improvement. If I can just control it, if I can just make sure that I always do my part right, then life will be manageable. I can find the handles on life. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for any of us, whether you have an addictive past or not. Life is a process of release. I had this occur to me this morning. Um, 
I got this idea of the, when you really want to hold on to something, you want to make sure you don't let it go, what do you do? You grip your fist and you hold on to it. And this is the way many of us try to do life with a clenched fist, holding on to what's mine, protecting, protecting, protecting. But there's no giving and receiving in this, is there? If you want to give, what do you have to do? You have to open that hand. And look what then happens. Your hand is open to receive. We say that giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin, and this is an example. This, you can remember this. You have a hand. You can remember what it looks like that when you're feeling yourself going through your day with your clenched fists and your clenched heart and your clenched mind, take your hand, open it up. This is how we're called to live, open. And people can see your imperfections when you do that, and it's scary. So the thing I want to really remind you of is that in this relative term, this relative place of of time and matter and form and space, nobody is perfect. I saw a church, that was their slogan, had a big banner on the side that said, perfect people not allowed. (laughs) And we do not expect you to be perfect in unity in that way. In the absolute truth, you are perfect. In Matthew 5, 48, it says, Be ye perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. In the Revised Standard Version, it actually says, You must be perfect. And I thought that was a law. I thought that was a rule. I thought that was God's telling me, You better be perfect. That's not actually what it's saying. It's saying, I know what is true about life and reality, and therefore I know you must be perfect, Claire. You must be perfect, Robert. Right? Your mama says so. I know. She's sitting right there beside you. (laughs) You are perfect and imperfect. This is the paradox that we're talking about today. That we, when I I told Howard before the first service, I really, I chose this verse weeks ago, and this I was going to talk about perfect love casting out fear, and then the talk sort of took this turn on me. I didn't expect to talk about perfectionism and authenticity and vulnerability, but that's what wanted to come through. I heard recently, or read recently, um, I spoke last week on You Cannot Fail on the Wednesday service, and the talk, the book that I was using was called Fail Fast, Fail Often, and it talks about this idea that we keep ourselves from success because we want to control, we want to manage Whereas successful people fail all the time. They're out there moving. They're trying. They're experimenting. They're putting it out there. That's what happens. That's what successful people do. And there was a a story that was cited in the book about a a pottery teacher in an arts college. And he got an idea. He said, for this semester, to his advanced pottery making class, he said, everybody on this side of the room, you're going to be judged solely on quantity. Don't worry about getting it right. Just make as many viable pots as you can this semester. And if you make 10 or more, you're going to get an A. I don't remember what the number was. But just don't worry about quality, just quantity. And said, everybody on this side of the room, you're going to be judged solely on quality. You may only produce one pot, but your entire grade will be on how high the quality of of that product is. At the end of the semester, the... The professor was not at all surprised that the quantity group created a ton of pots. They had a lot of output in what they'd done. The thing that surprised him, that shocked him to his core, they also produced the greatest quality. Why would that be? Because perfectionism will lock down our creativity faster than anything. It will lock down our enjoyment of the process better than anything. It's that control we can't create and control at the same time. Creativity is not something you manage. It's something you allow. Those who are artists, you know this. You can't make it happen. You can make the space for it to happen, then you've got to get out of the way and let love be revealed through your pot. I'm talking about pottery. Let love be revealed through your song. Let love be revealed through your child rearing. Let love be revealed through your work to open up and allow. 
So we are called to be perfect and imperfect. It is in our imperfection that divine, divine perfection can be revealed. This is a, you know, St. Paul and I, he and I go round and round sometimes. You know, he's, he's not very kind to women often in his writings. And, you know, the women can, should keep silent in the church. Yeah, try selling that at a unity convention and see what happens. <laughs> I would say more than half of the ministers in our movement are, are women, um, which I'm quite proud of. But he, he'd, every once in a while, as I'm arguing with St. Paul in one of his writings in the Bible, there will be this spark of the, the mystical truth that comes through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. Those of you who grew up in a Bible church like me, you know this passage. That there was something he wanted to be perfect in the body. He wanted to be perfect as a human being. And don't we teach that if you continue to practice spiritual principles, your life will get better and better. So it seems logical to our human brains that eventually I'm going to get it right. And this was where Paul was too. And it didn't happen. It, it, this, I don't know what, it, no scholar has ever been able to determine what the thorn in the flesh was for Paul, but something that caused him to be humble Something that caused him to remember that he's not perfect. And he prayed three times, he says, for God to remove it from him. And God said no. And finally, in 12.9, God says this. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you feel the mystery that's coming alive in that passage. God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. You see, sometimes we get this idea that God's going to just airlift me out of my problem and then deliver me over here where I'll be perfect. Your problem is the path. Your stumbling block is the doorway, is the stepping stone into who you are called to be. Grace is sufficient in that time of struggle, that's where in your imperfection, where God's perfection is revealed. But you have to be open. You can't be playing image management. You can't be, well, this is what Brene Brown says about that. Again, in the Gifts of Imperfection. She said, perfectionism, I'm having trouble with that word, which is kind of funny if you think about it. Perfectionism is at its core about trying to earn approval and acceptance. Most perfectionists were raised being praised for achievement and performances. Grades, manners, rule following, people pleasing, appearance, sports. Somewhere along the line, we adopt this dangerous and debilitating belief system. I am what I accomplish and how well I accomplish it. We please, we perform, we perfect. Healthy striving is self-focused. How can I improve? Perfectionism is other-focused. What will they think? So the third place I want to move us into today is this idea of, in the absolute, you're perfect. In the relative, you're imperfect. And the third point I want to leave you is that it is through your very imperfection that God's perfection is revealed, and that happens in the way we love. That happens in the way we come together in relationships. In the anybody else lived through the nineteen eighties? Anybody? A few of you did. Okay, good. <laughs> it was kind of the beginning of the self help movement. M. Scott Peck was in. I was introduced to his work in my first therapist's office, and uh, he he talked about this idea of codependence. That's where I was first diagnosed <laughs> as a codependent, where my my sense of who I am was dependent upon what you thought about me. And I was learned that that is not helping me much. It helped me find a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous is what it did, actually. But anyway, that's another story. And then I was taught that there is another way where I can be in independence rather than codependence. I can find my strength within myself. I can find my approval within myself. I can be okay without you. And what you think about me is none of my business, as Terry Cole Whitaker's book says. And it's great, and it's powerful, and that's where many of us first make those tentative steps into self-love. And the idea that I am okay. But I will tell you, when it comes to relationships, that independence thing is great, but love doesn't live there. There's a third place we have to go, and it's called interdependence, which requires risk, requires openness, requires authenticity, requires vulnerability. And that's what's calling to you, my friends. 
We come to unity to practice and to grow and to learn, and we get to learn to love. My friend Kathy Hearn says, spiritual community is where people grow up all over each other. (laughs) So I want to tell you today that wherever you are, you're okay. We love you. And you can come as you are to this church. I found this this week as well. Angelita Lim, she wrote, I saw that you were perfect, and so I loved you. Then I saw that you were not perfect, and I loved you even more. My dog, Larry. Let me tell you about Larry. I lost Larry about eight years ago. He was actually a replacement dog. I had rescued a little terrier mix from the SPCA in Dallas, and they had an outbreak of distemper, and she died, and it was really heartbreaking, and I've always been a real strong proponent of rescuing animals, but I couldn't risk it again. So I went to a breeder, and I found this, uh, I, found, I researched the, dog, the, the least popular dog breeds because I didn't want them to be overbred, so I found the Shelties were not real popular back then in the 90s, and I, and I found this great breeder, and I brought this little puppy home, and my little Larry is not the sharpest tool in the shed, but he was so sweet. I think the, the gene pool was rather shallow in his family. <laughs> sweet, sweet animal. Cynthia James, who was just here speaking to us a couple weeks ago, and she also led the uh, women's retreat, she was in my house one time in Dallas leading some work with my church there, she and her husband, and she got introduced to my Larry. And um, Larry was very loud, and every day at 3 o'clock, he would bark to keep the army of postmen that were trying to get into our house. He kept them away, kept me safe for years. I'm sure he thought that the house would be run over with mailmen if he didn't bark every day. But he was scared of noises and of shadows and... I mean, just he was a scared little dog. And so when Cynthia and and Carl were there at my house, my roof was being replaced. And so poor Larry was just beside himself. There was hammering all day long from above his head, and he didn't know what to do. So he was just sticking real close to me. And then we were in my den talking, and he comes in, and he rushes in, and he he flops on the floor and puts his head under the coffee table with his big body just sticking out. Cynthia said she has told that story for audiences all over the world because for her it demonstrates something about the way we manage our image. The many of us come together in community and we think that we're hiding. We put our head under that coffee table just like my Larry. But we see you. (laughs) We see you. We know you're not perfect. And it's okay. You You are called to bring your gift. You're not called to be perfect. I'd like to close with a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. Before the Council of Nicaea in the fourth 400s, there, was, um, there were many, many sacred texts that were circulated, circulated among the early Christians, including what we would call the, the books of the New Testament that are now scripture, but they weren't really considered scripture until the Council of Nicaea. And there were other books that got left out of the canon, including the Gnostic Gospels. And um, there's a reason the church fathers were, were seeking to solidify the message about what Christianity means and this idea of the blood blood atonement and redemption one way to God only through the the salvation through Jesus Christ accepting of the atonement of sins. That was the message. And so anything that was sort of outside of that framework was rejected. And the Gnostics believed that God is present everywhere if we can get to that light that is within all things. And this message was not necessarily popular. So these, these were removed. In the last uh, 30, 40 years, they've made a comeback, I'm happy to say. There's some great truth in these messages, and this is from the Gospel of Thomas. If you bring forth that which is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. There's a gift of God in you. It wants to be delivered through your very life. It's your fear that's keeping you from giving it. And what I'm here to tell you today is that we need it. Let us have it. Bring who you are into the world, into your family, and into this church. God bless you. I love you.